Now, Donald, I'll hand the floor over to you. Okay. Hey. Well, I'm very happy to introduce a good friend of mine, Jan Bell. Uh, we met about 15 years ago. He had seen some of my photographs of the Lagunitas Creek on the web. And he wrote to me and we got together and we went out to Bolinas and found out we had common interests and ended up at Lagunitas Creek shooting ripples and reflections and having a great time. So in this last 15 years, I've learned a lot about photography from Jan, which I thank him for very much. You'll see a lot of a graphic arts influence in Jan's work. He's a uh, former graphic artist. He worked for a TV station in Ohio. And But his care and attention to detail is just superb. The amount of time he puts in a, into a photograph, Photoshop and otherwise, and going out shooting is just incredible. The amount of time he spends and the uh, de attention to de detail, as I say, um, it's just incredible, and it pays off. If you uh, check his website, be sure to go to his shows and awards section, and you'll just be blown away at the, the scope of his work and the amount of war awards and grants he's gotten. He's gotten two large, large thousands of dollars of grants from these huge organizations. He's got a couple of those recently, so um, you'll understand why after you see his work. And uh, also, I wanted to show his book, which I'm a proud owner of. I don't know if you can see it in front of my picture there, but um, it's, it's there. The background is messing it up. It's there. Uh, which is incredible uh, amount of work went into that. It's printed in the duotone process by uh, Hemlock printers in, in uh, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And it's absolutely uh, about 150 pages of absolutely beautiful work. Um, just absolutely stunningly reproduced in the duotone process where they run it through the press more than once to um, get a full range of tones mm -hmm. printing job. But I'm excited to see what Jan has in this presentation. I didn't get a preview, and uh, although I've seen lots of his interviews and talks, so I, I know what we're in store for here. And without any further ado, we'll turn it over to Jan. And uh, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised what, about his work. Welcome, Jan. Thanks, Don. Hey, Thanks buddy. to the Fairfax uh, Camera Club. Been in Fairfax a few times in my life. Um, I would prefer being there than Ohio, but uh, this is where my life is, so uh, it's all it's all fine. Um, my presentation is kind of divided into two parts. The first part is an eight-minute um, slideshow interspersed with some quotes and some of my philosophical views on photography. After that, we'll take a break and you can ask any questions. Um, I welcome any comments. Then I'll move on into my presentation. So um, I communicate better visually through my art than I do speaking. But uh, um, like I said, I'm glad to be here. So I will share the screen now and start this presentation.
Okay. Can you all hear me? Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully you have some questions or some comments before we move on. Exquisite. Thanks. No, they were lovely. Uh, thank you. Um, in the style of Ansel Adams with maybe a contemporary twist. But uh, that's, I think, where I got my beginning looking at his photographs many years ago. And uh, falling in love with California on many of my visits, that was kind of the beginning of all this. Your photographs are amazing. Um, the depth of field on some of the landscapes is just phenomenal. What what do you normally shoot at when you're doing landscapes like that? Do you mean as far as an f-stop? F-stop, yeah. Uh, I try to keep it around 11 if I can. Uh, okay. Sometimes I move up to 13 or 14. Uh, sometimes they do focus stacking to um, achieve what I need. Mm -hmm. But like when you said the landscapes, many of those are um, kind of in the distance. So they tend to stay in focus. But yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm OCD about everything. So um, I'm paying attention to exactly where I'm focusing and what I'm focusing on. Mm -hmm. And 
Mm -hmm. Ironically, I shoot a lot less than most people. I've been with photographers whose shutter is just, you know, clicking by <laughs> at a rapid rate compared to me. But uh, I just put a lot yeah. more thought into what I think I put a lot more thought into what I'm doing. So I have to take less. I mean, so that I can take less uh, exposures because honestly, when I get home, I don't like looking through, you know, thousands of images. So I have narrowed it down up front. So there's less uh, to do on the back end. I love the I movement of the water in your pictures. Mm -hmm. the I'm mesmerized by water. Um, and when I look in, when I, when I see the back of my camera on the screen, I'm, I'm just like a child. I get giddy. It's like, it's just so exciting to see what happens and every frame is different. Um, because of the movement of the water. So that is one time that I'll shoot um, more than what I would if I were shooting like a landscape so that I can get, you know, different mm -hmm. um, flows of water. And many times I'll take portions of one um, capture and portions of another and bring them together to form the final photo. Hmm. But yeah, it's water. And I don't live, well, I do live near Lake Erie, but Lake Erie just, uh, I don't have one photo from Lake Erie. I have a lot yeah. from Erie, a lot from, a lot from the Pacific. So, Jen, you'll have to mention your Lake Superior uh, workshops also. Yes, about, I will. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about your shutter speed on the uh, motion of the water. You're using the neutral density filter. I do. And uh, mm -hmm. can you explain that a little bit? I think it varies all over the place. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm more, I'm, I'm totally more of an artist than I am a technician. Um, I, we all rely on our cameras mm -hmm. and uh, we can't be where we're at if we don't use good glass and have decent cameras. But um, I, I vary the shutter speeds a lot. And I just look at the, look at the monitor again to see what I'm getting. And by yeah. varying the shutter speed, the look of the of the photo changes drastically. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. sometimes to get what I want, the image comes out a little darker than what I'd like, but that can all be taken care of um, yeah. in camera raw and in Photoshop. So um, most of the most of the work, I shouldn't say most of it. Some of my exposures have been five or six minutes if I really want to smooth water down and have it be just smooth yeah. like glass. Uh, when water is moving fast, um, there's a there's a photo that you'll see uh, later on in this presentation called Swift Swiftly Move Swift Moving Stream, and that water was just rushing by. So the shutter speed had to be pretty short, or it would have totally just been you know it would have formed milk. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. Thanks, Someone Jen. Else had a question. Um, I think it was you, David. Maybe you were going to ask something. Oh yeah, a lot of your skies um, are like charcoal. Didn't you intentionally change them to that, or was that charcoal? Like... You mean charcoal? To Very me, dark. It means dark. It's much darker than the uh, the landscape. Well, they use like at night with you know moonscapes, like over no, the. No, I, I haven't had shots. any of that. Uh, I use vignettes. Um, I, in my, in my workshop, I will show an image and turn the vignette off and it's just a totally different look. The vignette to me really draws the eye into the center of, of the screen. Mm -hmm. um, in the last presentation, someone mentioned that my work seemed very dark and they asked if I always shoot dark and I, I don't, I mean, some of the, um, the structures were not dark. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we all vary how we interpret an image over time, how I would have interpreted it three or four years ago, maybe different than now. So ironically, I was looking at the second image last night and I happened to lighten the vignette a bit and then resaved it. So yeah, it changes. <clears throat> but I, I wouldn't say there's any, I'm surprised you used the word charcoal, but um uh, Don one time talked about uh, a conversation he had with Ansel Adams when Ansel was reviewing his work and, and Ansel said there's too much soot well that means just everything's blocked in you know you can't see any detail in the black so it's critically important to me that there is detail in the black 
And I feel so much frustration uh, when I see a show and <clears throat> it's apparent that the artist is not concerned with blowing out highlights or filling in the blacks. Um, I don't know whether they haven't been taught that or whether it's just a new hip uh, trend. Um, I don't know, but uh, I guess we all have to follow our own path. I love that one photo with the um, launch for hire, you know, from Point Reyes out there yeah. you know, that I've seen a million times, but the surface of the water was so interesting on that one. Was there fog no. on the water or? No, um, that photo required, well, I've shot there many times and never got anything that I felt uh, happy with until this last time. And yeah. That photo took a lot of work as far as masking. I don't know if any of you use masks in Photoshop, but I couldn't do what I do without masks. And then the only purpose for a mask is so that you can then use a curve to change the tonal quality. In this case, I used a mask so that I could drop in water um, to create that long, smooth feel of that water. So what you would see if you were standing by me when I'm shooting is not what you will see in my work. Um, I'm not a documentary photographer. If I were, I couldn't be changing things that way, or I would, you know, my reputation would go down the drain. But as an artist, I feel that you know I can do whatever I choose to do, as in, as a painter does. I mean, a painter will go out and take a uh, snapshot, and then come home and do their interpretation of that painting. So yeah. I feel that's how I work. Yeah. I think that's where the fine art thing comes into your work. You, Thanks. Yeah. You really can call yourself a fine artist, fine art, uh, because you are. You, a lot of thought goes into it. So congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. We had that discussion many times. Yeah, so, we sure have. Any, anything else uh, before I move on? Uh, yeah. Uh, don't forget to mention your workshops. Okay. Uh, it's in here. You, yeah, and your book again. Uh, yep. Buy his book, people. It's it's seventy five dollars, but it'll be the best seventy five dollars you ever spend. Well, you should be my salesperson. Free, but uh, you should be my salesperson. It yeah. is a great awesome. book. Hemlock great printing book. Yeah, an outstanding job. I talked with John Sexton oh. a few times before I printed it. He used um, a company in L.A., and I got a quote from them in the process but they closed their doors before I had a chance to go to print. So um, I used Hemlock Printing. Uh -huh. They used much of the same processes. They were acquainted with the full tone process that's used by, um, that was used by, um, I'm having a mental block, the name of the printing company in LA, it doesn't matter. But anyhow, um, the photos look so close to the originals. I I'm just really pleased with how that came out. Uh -huh. And it's printed on, cover weight paper throughout so it's a heavy book uh there's no bleed through from page to page yeah um, yeah the du duo tone process printing process is, is incredible the range of tones the really set really dark blacks and and detail it creates more of a 3d feel too yeah um, yeah yeah um, they sent me so many proofs um i i was getting proofs uh in the mail all the time because i couldn't be there in person due to covid I couldn't cross the border into Canada, but um, yeah, when I compared the duotone, which is really subtle, I mean, if someone opened the book, they would just think it's black and white, but it's actually a duotone, but that adds so much depth to the, to the images. And that's um, one thing I learned from John Sexton. I assume some of you know John um, from Carmel Valley there. Uh, excellent, excellent uh, uh, photographer and has done several books. Ansel Adams assistant at one point. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, yeah Alan Ross and then so many. Yeah. yeah. So anything else before I move on? No one wants to know my shoe size or anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um uh, I got a few questions, but never mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, this, this is kind of a trial run of this presentation. Uh, I have shown the first portion before, um, I've spent hours and hours on this second portion. I would really like feedback. Uh, was, was the eight minute presentation too long in your opinion to start out this, mm -hmm. this, this 
No, I thought it was perfect. No, it was perfect. Lovely. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it was Great. perfect. I you know, like divided it up into sections too. It'd yeah. be interesting to hear what a young person would say. I mean, young people are so used to, you know, everything being fast paced. Um, I think all of us are a bit older and I think we're more accustomed to things being a little slower. So, uh, I, yeah, it doesn't it matter. Could actually, pardon me, but it could have been actually slower. I think you could have spent more time on each. Well, I guess I, it's kind of like, a gallery show. I mean, none of you could come to a gallery to see my work where you mm -hmm. would, you know, take your time and, and look at a print and then move on. So, you know, I, I put five seconds on each one and did a uh, second and a half dissolve between them. So anyhow, and I liked, you know, the, the quotes. Uh, I think there's a lot to say in those. So I guess we'll move along. Mm -hmm. Okay, can everyone see the, the, the agave? Yep. Um, you saw two of these agaves. Um, I'm just curious. None of you see um, any of of the Zoom windows with our faces, correct? All you're seeing is just... Yeah, I just the, see you on the print. Mm -hmm. you? you do see me or you don't? I do. I see yeah. a column with Good. all of the faces. Yeah. So during the uh, the presentation, the um, the first presentation, some of the some of the type from the quotes went behind the faces. Is that correct? Yes. So I should have minimized that. Okay. I just closed the bar with the faces. Okay. On Zoom. Good. Good. All right. So um, switch to speaker view. What's that? If you switch to, well, maybe that's just on an iPad. I'm looking on an iPad. If you switch to speaker view rather than um, gallery view, then okay. you only see the person who is speaking or making sounds like, you know, with your slideshow. And okay. Maybe I'm not understanding what the issue is, but I think each person creates their own view. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Got you. So um, since this is kind of the first run through on this, um, I, I have some copy prepared. So you'll actually see that I'm um, reading, correct? So my wife told me not to read, but I'm going to anyhow. So <laughs> my own boss. Okay. Um, this is a quote that I use to, to lead into my book. Um, I hope that my work will encourage self-expression in others and stimulate the search for beauty and creative excitement in the great world around us. That's exactly what his work his work did for me. Uh, seeing the the beauty in North America just instilled a feeling of of wow. I wanted to get out and explore and see the same areas, um, which I've done. And um So I start with the early years. Um, I grew up on a farm in the Midwest in Ohio. My brothers were several years um, older than I was. So I sort of grew up as an only child. I feel that's what formed my uh, solitary nature. I was able to roam the countryside at my leisure. I loved walking in the woods in the spring. This was a very early beginning of my love of the outdoors. Um, all we, the only camera we had in the house was a Kodak Duraflex. Everything seemed magical to me as I peered through the glass view. I okay. was baffled at why everything was reversed, but um, I persevered. I photographed anything and everything, um, cattle out in the fields, flowers, uh, the woods, whatever. Uh, I mailed the, the, the film off for processing, and I was always impatient uh, to see it returned. My father attended college for agriculture and was totally focused on, on his farming I uh, made the cover of the Ohio Farmer magazine at one time. That said, I wasn't so enamored by the work when I was young, but now I see young people starting up small organic farms and they seem quite happy and it's very alluring to me. I, I remember going down to Bolinas and always looking at 
on the produce farm that's on the right after you turn left to go into Molinas. There's a, a nursery on the corner there. And I always really loved looking at that, that farm. Um, not surprisingly, I plan on studying horticulture, but transitioned to uh, art my senior year of uh, high school. I attended private college, a fine art, a very uh, in a small, older building. We had outstanding professors who were there at all hours with us. Uh, so I couldn't have hoped for anything more. Uh, I transferred to a university where um, I majored in graphic design and did a minor in fine art photography. And I still keep in touch with my um, graphic design and fine art photography instructor. He lives here in the in in my hometown. And um, I worked with Kodak in um, in the summer months. <clears throat> Um, early on, right after college, I worked next to a professional staff of photographers. They shot products for Fortune 500 companies. It seemed like boring work at the time, but I learned a lot and had access to slide film processing. Plus, as you'll see in uh, some of the colored work that's to come. Uh, I spent 31 years at PBS. I loved working with a multitude of students from the university that we were affiliated with. Uh, we sort of fed off of each other, but one didn't know, um, the other did. While it might seem strange that I listed Macworld, uh, honestly, I don't feel that I'd be where I'm at today had it not been for this experience. It's where I first saw Photoshop. I think it was possibly 1.0 or soon thereafter. More importantly, it was the beginning of my ex exploration in California. Um, the city itself, I did a lot of... Um, walking around the city doing photos. Uh, that's where some of the agaves came from. Uh, the coastal areas, the redwoods, the valley, Yosemite, and, and everywhere in between. Each year I would spend a week or two after Macworld and uh, just go out and shoot photos. Um, I, I was fortunate to have a job where I could take time off for my art shows and for these photo trek treks. This is kind of a, a quick abridged CV. Um, 2001 is kind of when this all began. Um, I did an outdoor trek with a friend, and he said he was going to take his, his camera along. So, of course, I couldn't be outdone, and I took mine. Then the next year, I had a first public showing of my work in a coffee shop uh, here in my hometown. Uh, the next year, I won a Best of Show Award at an outdoor art fair. I remember um, a woman coming in to my booth and looking at the award and then looking at me, and she said, this isn't good for you, you know. You know, you'll get a big head and it, it's just not a good thing. It's like, well, gee, thank you very much for your comment, but whatever. And then in 2010, I won the Ansel, and Ansel Adams, the Ansel Adams Award uh, presented by the family for one of the uh, succulent photos that you saw in the slideshow. Then the next year, um, I had a gallery show uh, at the Joseph Saxon uh, Gallery of Photography. And uh, in working with the curator, I really gained a confidence in what I was doing. And that kind of has propelled me into the, the last decade of my work. And of course, you can see my website. Early photographs. I thought it'd be interesting to show you where I came from and how I was thinking at that time and um, where I'm at now. So the waves. Uh, I was enamored, enamored with Wayne, with Maine when I first visited in the mid-1970s after my uh, final year of college. I had never seen an ocean. The movement of water mesmerized. I loved the geology. I loved the pines. It all came together in this photograph. Um, um, but ironically, it was all kind of accidental because uh, I didn't mean to do a long exposure. Um, so moving forward, uh, I realize how much I've, I've built on the past. I refine the use of long exposure work, the water, the rocks, the trees, the mountains, they all stir my soul. Uh, I've set, assembled a large um, body of long exposure work, which you saw in the slideshow. Um, typical images of water, uh, cloud movement, long exposures, yada, yada, yada. And going back, this is what um, I shot in the mid-70s. And this is what I'm doing today. Um, 
This image is all about symmetry, uh, centering of my subject, lines leading back into space, use of bold tones. Um, Cypress Tunnel from Point Reyes makes use of these same uh, techniques. I use bold, dark tones. Blacks are never filled in, although they may appear so in your zoom window. Um, I don't know, but there is texture um, in the tree and the trunks of the trees. So again, very different subject matter, but very similar. So it, I just find it interesting how I was thinking back then, which has led to what I do now. This was shot um, during college, actually, um, um, an artist friend, a painter friend. And we did a lot of photography in Cleveland, Ohio. And she lived in uh, Coventry, an area uh, with, with older apartments. So this was uh, photographed in her stairwell. While different, there's a similarity here. Um, symmetry, centering, bold use of uh, contrast and tones, um, a sense of impending movement, um, yada, yada, yada. So, oh. A photographic journey, which you've, you've seen a little bit of it, but this is kind of the first photo that um, that um, my graphic design was really coming through. I called it my saltine cracker uh, just for fun, although it's an adobe house that was photographed in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Subject matter couldn't be any more simple, yet it speaks volumes by being so bold. I love the contrast of color, the texture, and so forth. Um, by the way, this is an image that uh, was processed at the commercial photo lab that I mentioned earlier. Uh, an interesting story about working there. I was put in charge of the lab while the technician and he showed me how to um, replenish the tanks with chemistry. And in doing so, I, I, I had obviously not paid close enough attention when he explained it or I wasn't paying close enough attention when I was doing the work, but I put the wrong chemicals in the wrong tanks. So all the chemicals of film that the company had that processed um, were ruined. And i surprised I didn't lose my job, but I didn't. I, I don't even think they, they yelled at me or anything, but uh, learning experience like measure one three times and cut once, something like that. So. This is uh, an image that I call Sparks. It's um, of a campfire. Uh, I'm sitting with my son. He stirred the embers. I shot the photos. Again, a bold use of color, graphic lines, simplicity. Um, I took the photo into monochrome and then um, introduced the blue color. Um, this is called Spiral Succulent. It may be the first of many suc. It is the first of many succulents that I um, ever photographed seriously. It was growing in a succulent garden on the property of the Big Sur Bakery. Uh, maybe some of you have been there, down in Big Sur. It's one of my favorite places to grab a scone and a cup of coffee and sit outside and just look up at the mountains uh, over Pfeiffer, Big Sur. I got to, the, got to know the owner and was told that I could shoot here anytime that I was in the area. Um, I was later told that it's a rare type of succulent. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence is really at play here. Um, which is a sequence in which the numbers is some of the two preceding ones uh, for you math people. Again, it illustrates the use of color, shape, texture, and form, and perfect symmetry. Uh, while photographing here, I wasn't paying close enough attention and backed up to a very large succulent that was taller than me. And it did not have thorns, but it had hairs that had barbs on the end. And those hairs went through my shorts and through my boxers and into my skin. So um, I wasn't sure what to do. So I went into the artist co-op and said, what the hell do I do? So she said, just go back in the back area. There's a music performance area and do whatever you have to do to uh, take care of it. And it, it took a while to uh, pull those little barbs out of my butt. So all, the, all these little stories along the way, um, just make it also, I don't know, worthwhile. This is called uh, Safari Succulent. It was shot in Bolinas. Uh, I was there and I saw this on uh, the deck, I believe, of a dentist. And it was too high for me to shoot. So I climbed up onto the um, either the hood or the roof of the rental car and uh, so I could shoot straight down on it. 
I don't think I damaged the car. Although one time I did damage a car uh, near Yosemite, I had a rental car and um, had food inside the car before I knew that that's a no-no and a bear tried to get in and there were some scratch marks by the door, which the rental company never saw. Um, this is called Forest Floor Detail. It's shot in the Upper Peninsula along Lake Superior. Um, it's not the same as what you've seen, but it is just a bold use of color and textures and subject matter that, that, that I just really like. These kind of herald back to um, what Don Kinney was talking about. I saw those images of ripples on water and was fascinated. So I've done many, many of these shots through the years. This one is at Lake Superior. Um, the shores are lined with trillions, literally trillions of stones. Um, these particular stones were in a shallow pool of water with a gentle breeze blowing across the surface of uh, surface of the water, forming the facets that you see here. Um, in situations like this, every uh, capture will be different, so I advise people to take a lot. This is very similar, uh, a different location, a location where I take uh, my workshop participants. It's a huge harbor. Uh, it's about a half hour drive from the main road, but I was fascinated by the line going through the one stone, so I put it in the middle and did, you know, the shot. So why do we do... I don't know if I assume this is true in any of the arts. It's so much work. Um, there are ongoing challenges <clears throat> for photographers who do landscapes. We need to be outside. So we deal with the weather, the dust storms, uh, damaged camera gear. Well, I lost uh, a couple of lenses and damaged a body on the last night of a shoot of, of a trek after Macworld. I was down by. Um, Big Sur in and came back one evening, opened the car door, grabbed my camera bag and flung it on my back and it wasn't closed. So all the gear went out onto the asphalt and uh, it was a sick feeling. But fortunately, it was on the on the last night uh, before I was flying home. Uh, I no longer fly. Um, I take a camper and just immerse myself in, in the landscape, which you'll see later. Anyhow, if you feel any euphoria, I want to see what I've captured and uh, a portfolio photo makes it all worthwhile. Obstacles, at least for me, um, we all encounter them. Um, well, life is easy here in the Midwest. It's quite mundane. I uh, always have my eyes open trying to find subject matter, but it just doesn't happen. Um, there's only a couple of photos in my portfolio that were shot within 100 miles of my home. Uh, I've had people tell me there are things to shoot. If only I look a little harder, but I, I just disagree. You all are so fortunate to live uh, where you live. I spent a lot of money on gasoline campsites last spring. It cost me $1,400 in gasoline just to travel from Ohio to um um, um, which can't, it's, um, I'm sorry, it's the campground on the Sir, Fran Sir Francis Drake between Fairfax and, uh, so 1400 bucks. Camp, Camp Taylor. Yes, yeah, Samuel P. Taylor. Thank you. Yeah. You got it. Um, I had a headwind the entire way. So I was filling up four or five times a day. It just was really depressing. But it's a reality of doing what I do. Um, <clears throat> but for me, being in the world is is just um, so nourishing to my soul. Speaking of being off the grid, I came across this cool little campground. I wouldn't even call it a campground. It was just a place to pull in uh, when I was down my Monument Valley. And I just had to laugh. It's like, this is just this, this classic. So uh, I pulled in and spent a night or two. This is uh, the Alabama Hills. Maybe some of you have been there. Uh, it fascinates me. This is off the main movie road. Uh, road, And that's my camper back there in the middle. You see a little silver um, uh, thing. And here's a closer view of it. This was my view um, every day looking up at Mount Whitney. I hadn't planned on spending, you know, nine days here but i did i i just couldn't get myself to leave this was 
the the perfect camp spot that I've ever stayed at while I'm in this location. Um, I've stayed here many times. <clears throat> this is Canyon Lands. I snagged the best campsite in the campground after being invited to share a couple's campsite for one night. We had a nice conversation and um, they said that I could just pull in and uh, park my little camper in front of theirs. Um, but anyhow, this is the only campsite in the campground that's an hour off the highway that uh, has, does not have a view of any other campsites. Problem is, you get back, you can't reserve these campsites at this campground, and it takes an hour to get back here. And if there's, if there isn't a place to camp, um, there's no BLM. Well, there is BLM land. I spent a night, one night on BLM land near here. Hmm. Another time, this was near the Goosenecks, which is by Magic Hat in, um, in U Southern Utah. I arrived at this location after dark. I'd never been there before and was unfamiliar with the terrain. There were a dozen or so makeshift campsites along the rim of the canyon. Um, there were only three or four people camping from what I could tell, so I pretty much had my pick of locations. When I woke, I saw the beauty before me. Uh, I viv vividly remember making a pot of coffee and sitting outside and enjoying and just soaking up that beauty. Um, as I've told people, it's not a place you'd want to sleepwalk. <laughs> laundry day is a necessary evil um, um because of this i travel with a lot of clothing especially underwear at the onset of covid i wouldn't go inside a laundromat even with my n95 mask so i took to doing my laundry in a rubber made dish pan i continue to do so do this um ever since and don't want to waste my time sitting inside laundromats plus um, I did my laundry at a campground near Olima last year, and someone had used dryer sheets inside the dryer, and my clothing just reeked of fragrance for days. I, I would hang the clothing outside. Uh, I was at State Park, and I and I hung the um clothing on the bushes, and I, I couldn't get rid of that smell. <laughs> and here's my drying rack. Um. Again, I was by myself, so uh, I mean, if someone was walking around the campground, I suppose they could have seen it. But there were only uh, uh, thirteen campsites in this canyon campground, Calf Creek Canyon, um, uh, near 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 Boulder, I believe, um, Utah. Uh, the last morning I was there, I woke to this view: um, mm -hmm. oh. the road up there on the top right, um, and that was well, it's looking the other direction. But uh, this canyon is just, is incredible. I spent 10 nights here. I went into town to get groceries. Um, and they brought them out to the truck um, because, again, I wouldn't go inside. But the I was asking about the snowfall. I said, you know, it's down a hill. Do they plow? And, and the woman said, I don't believe so. But she told me that they would call me the following day to make sure I was okay. And if I didn't answer the phone because it's pretty remote, they would drive out and see that I was okay. So little thing. Along the way. Um, shooting loca uh, location shooting. Uh, pretty straightforward. I think most of you know this. Uh, weather changes abruptly. Um, I, I think some people don't think about these things. Um, I have actually have a list um, that lists all the gear that I'll need when I go out on a shoot because it's so easy to to overlook something. And if I have a checklist, you know, it's, it's always right there. Know how your equipment works. Make sure it's working properly. Pack what you need for the day. Take food, water, sunscreen, yada, yada, yada. And for me, I use an in-reach satellite communicator because I travel by myself. And uh, you never know really what's going to happen. Um, just an example of being prepared. I knew it was good. The rain was predicted that day. This is at Cape Perpetua uh, along the coast in uh, central Oregon. <laughs> Here's a shot that uh, from a few years previous. Yeah, and it's taken during a 12 week um, trek 
uh, funded by Luminous Landscape. So um, I, I had the, the worst, the worst weather that they have ever had on record during that 12 week period. Um, I had problems with um, rain gear for the camera. It just wasn't working well. So I finally just gave up and, and bought some heavy Visqueen clear uh, plastic and made like a skirt that went around the camera. Um, I was using this, uh, what is it, Aquatech. And as you can see, you just can't get your hands in. Um, I've s since switched to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm playing a mental block here for a sec. Not that it matters. Um, it's not there. A, a different brand that works quite well. So the beginning of this trip, uh, the beginning of this 12-week trip, I was in Olympic National Park for, I, I think, three weeks. And they, like I said, had the worst weather on record. In fact, they um, closed part of the park for the first time on record. Uh, the campground where I camped for two weeks was abruptly closed one evening. They didn't give us much time to evacuate. Fortunately, there were only a handful of us camped there, so I had to move on, but I didn't know uh, to where. I called a friend who lived down in Eugene, and he said the winds were horrific everywhere. So I found a storage shed uh, just down the road where people stored RVs during the off-season. Uh, that night, the sound of hail hitting the roof was so loud that it was totally impossible to sleep. Uh, I spent one night there, then moved on to an old shed lo located on First Nation property, where I, um, they had once been a large sawmill. I think I spent two nights there, but uh, it was quite an experience. Then moving on over near Capitol Reef, uh, this was not this past fall, but the fall before. Um, it got down to single digits for a couple of nights and the winds were unbelievable. And this dust was literally like powder. It was coming in the front window of the camper and um, these these have an incredible signal, but it still got in. So, um, following two slides may be the most important points that I'll make this evening. Um, I I don't think people take enough time to be to contemplate to think about their work. Uh, I think personally, I think it's important to study the work of other photographers. Um, I was listening to uh, an artist talk a couple of weeks ago. And this particular person who I've created photos with uh, said, I will not look at other work. I, I want my work to be original. So that's the way he works. I feel it's important to see what's been done before us. I like looking at what's being done now. Um, I, I, it's just all fascinating. I look at books. Uh, I buy way too many books. Um, I like magazines, visit museums, galleries, whatnot. Spend a lot of time online. It's important to follow your heart. Um, some people want to photograph flowers. Some want to photograph their pets. Um, I, I, or, or people like you. Um, but um, for me, you meaning Stephanie, for me, I, I want to photograph things that don't move, that don't talk back to me, that will just sit there and and allow me to have uh, what, however much time I need with them. So it's like I said, it's important to follow your heart, but learn the basics. Um, and what you create should be an expression of your yourself. So many people, so many photographers are caught up in gear tech. Um, I was in Zion one time and pulled uh, off the road near the bridge where people photograph that I think it's called the Three Sisters, and there were twenty some people lined up there, and I just smiled to myself. It's like there's no way I'm going to join them. So um, I let them do their thing and walked on. And I have a good friend who is a gearhead. I mean, he seems to have limitless uh, funds to purchase gear and uh, does so. Um, but for me, it's about the art. You can have all the gear in the world, but if you don't take time to be contemplative and think about what you're doing and know where you want to go, that gear is not going to do you any any good. There's a little book titled the best camera is the one you have with you. I don't necessarily adhere to this philosophy, nor do I promote it, but I think it makes a good point. Um, a couple of photos that you saw down on my iPhone. Um, it's the only camera I had with me at the time, and um, they hold up fine, but won't print large. 
Okay, continuing, uh, consider enrolling in a workshop. Um, I'd love to have you in mine. Um, and I'll talk about more that a bit, a bit later. But most of us work in an isolated environment unless you work in a warehouse setting with other artists, you know, um, which I think would be really awesome in some ways. Although being an introvert and a solitary person, I, I like my studio here. It's my favorite place to be. Um, the instruction in a workshop can help you achieve your vision. And I'll say this over and over and over, scout a location before ca capturing fo photos. Um, time and time and time again, people jump out of their car or or what, literally jump out of the car and start taking pictures. It's like, how do you know what you want to take a picture of if you are if you don't take the time to look around? Um, for me, a phone camera is, is one of my most important tools. Um, and I use my iPhone to scout and you'll see that in the next uh, the next screen here. So you, you take you, you do some shooting, you evaluate those images, then you start the serious stuff. For me, the serious stuff is kind of a pain in the ass because I shoot on a tripod. It's not easy to try different angles. Um, so the iPhone allows me to do that. And then when I know what I want to photograph, I'm ready to um, bring out the, the big guns. And um, because of that, I come home with, with less to look at. And I, I mentioned that earlier. So here's, um, this is, hold on a sec. This is um, near Houghton, Michigan. Uh, the Quincy Mines were located just north of the, the, the town. They were, they were over 9,000 feet deep and one of the largest suppliers of copper in the world. The buildings are now on the National Historic uh, Site Registr Registrar. The strange looking unit was used to reclaim stamp, uh, stamping sand from Torch Lake. I saw the structure one day and returned the next to do some scouting. And as you can see by the changing clouds, I was there for a while. Uh, each of the four photos has a different look and feel. Some il illustrate the tipping of the building more than others. Some show more of the position of the landscape. Some are a wide crop, some tighter. One shows only water, whereas the rest show varying amounts of land. I actually like the clouds a lot in the lower right-hand photo, and I would use those in any of the photos that I would choose, uh, that, that I would select. So taking this a step further, I illustrate how the four images might appear in black and white. Keep in mind, they're only scouting photos, and I don't do this very often. It's rare that I would take the time to look at them um, converted to black and white before making a selection. But there is a slight difference um, in how something, how we perceive things in color and how we see, perceive them in black and white. So I just thought this would be, you know, uh, really pretty cool to show. Striving for excellence, something we all do. Uh, I've been using Photoshop for almost 40 years, so I know it pretty well. It allows me to do everything that I want it to do, even when I'm unsure of how to achieve my goal. All I have to do is sit and think for a few seconds, and a new technique will um, come to mind. <clears throat> Hold on a sec. Um, let me pause here for a second. Um, hmm, yes, there, sorry, I was on the wrong slide. Um, being one of the early pioneers of Photoshop, there was no easy way to undo a change. Uh, I don't know how many of you ever worked with like Photoshop one, two or three, but, uh, it was a pain. You, you did something. It was, it was like painting. I mean, once you apply paint to a canvas, it's there. You can try and remove it or, or go over it, but it's there. So, uh, as Photoshop advanced, uh, it made it so much easier to use. I am a big user of masks and tonal curves. Um, I, I couldn't live without them. Uh, some of my images take a long time. Um, uh, once in a while, I, I'll find something that doesn't take much work and, and that's always very nice. Um, and some never make it. I have over 
300 photos in a folder that I call in progress. Um, I, I revisit them from time to time. And once in a while, one of them will make it into my portfolio. But uh, there are images that I would like to, to add, but they're just not quite there. And I touched on this earlier, how I interpret a photo of, evolves over time. So I show this, um, I call this the road to Point Reyes. It's one of my favorite places in the Pacific. It's a long drive from where I'm allowed to camp. So it's not easy to shoot on multiple days. This image has remained in my in-progress folder for more than two years, maybe three. I'd work on it and save it. Periodically, I'd revisit it and make changes. It took a lot of work to finalize this photograph. And I show it only uh, to illustrate uh, the number of layers that I often use. And you don't see them here on this screen grab, uh, but it does show uh, that I was using uh, many layers. Speaking of tough work, I shot an image in Marin County last spring, uh, one that you saw in the slideshow. After sho shooting it, I moved uh, on down the coast to a place called uh, Salt Point. I'm sure some of you have been there. Upon evaluating the photo, I realized I didn't like the foreground. But um, it was a good photograph. I, I didn't, I was really frustrated because I didn't want to just toss it. So I knew I needed a shot of the wild radish plants that were in bloom on several fields that I saw near Pierce Point Farm at Point Reyes. You know that? It was a tough decision whether to drive three hours back. The light would have to match and the weather pattern is often totally different out on Point Reyes. But I checked the weather forecast and decided to go for it. Um, so I spent pretty much the whole day going back to photograph those wild radish fields. And um, all in all, it worked. And I'm happy with, with the photograph. Uh, my photographic style, water landscapes, botanical structures, you saw those. I steer away from what I call picture postcards. Uh, there are other people doing those and doing them well. So that's their thing. No need for me to do them. I I capture my photos on overcast days. Because of that, the sky is a massive light box. I don't need to rise before sunrise, which is good by me. Uh, I'm just not an early morning person. Um, I try to express my <laughs> myself and my work. And like I said earlier, the final photo may not look anything like what you saw if you're standing beside me. That's not often the case, but uh, that is the case sometimes. And um, I was told by a good friend who uh, had attended Photo Lucida, Lucida, Photo Lucida, one of the two. Um, anyhow, he, his work was similar to mine. And he said he was told, you know, it's out of vogue. It's just not what they were looking for. But um, I follow my heart and it served me well. Um, I was talking with Keith Davis. I don't know if any of you know him. He... Uh, worked for Hallmark for a while, amassing a photo collection of over 4,000 photos. So it had nothing to do with the, the greeting cards. But obviously, photography was important to someone at at, um, at Hallmark. And uh, um, I, I talked with him after the last show, and he, he, I, I, it's obvious you understand uh, classic black and white photography. Um, I want to the the um first place award in that show for um I think the next photo you'll see yes Mitch McCotton stillness it's one of my favorite locations on Lake Superior a place I've been granted permission to visit by the First Nation people to bring my workshop participants um soft bright light quiet interpretation of the scene I used a long exposure to soften the water and aided that with the um with some of my many Photoshop techniques. Um, I think this photo works because it has leading lines, rich blacks, it has trees, rocks, water, soft clouds, um, every element that stirs my soul. Um, this photo has received a first place award and two juried exhibitions uh, so far this year. Now, this photo represents the essence of the interplay between the beautiful volcanic rock and the action of the waves. Um, standing in a precarious spot, waves were pouring past me now and then. I bore down my tripod to secure myself as well as the camera. 
Um, nice thing about shooting on Lake Superior is that there's no salt in the water. So um, you don't have that to contend with and corrode your uh, your gear. This is a location that we visit um, during my workshop. Uh, I use two or three, maybe four photos. I like different portions of different photos. So I bring them together to form. Um, so let's ask how I photograph rock and have moving water. Um, I guess the, photo, the person wasn't acquainted with uh, long exposure photography. This uh, stream narrows down to a very narrow area. Um, I was standing uh, perched on a very narrow ledge. Uh, I would not have wanted to fall into the water, but uh, I think um, um, this is an area where people actually slide uh, down the chutes in, in the summertime. This was a really difficult photo for me. I love this location. Um, I caught seafoam in a narrow inlet. Um, it was shown in, in the slideshow. Um, and I've also showed you um, what wave action can do to create seafoam. It, it's like crema on espresso. The foam was raging in and gently flowing out with each passing wave. Um, I shot for an hour, probably a lot more. But it was tough. I, I just couldn't get the tones of the foam to look like shiny crema. Uh, combined several photos um, to create this final image again. Uh, I like the little waterfalls coming over the, the rocks in the background. Uh, but anyhow, after readjusting adjusting and readjusting the curves in this this portion in the front, I, I finally got the water, the foam to look the way I wanted it to. Uh, point raised, called Twilight at Point Raised. Um, this is one of my favorite locations to shoot. I'd spent the day in Point Raised and Twilight was upon me. Twilight's my favorite time of the day. A couple had a small fire on the beach and were having a picnic. I made several shots as the current surf was coming in and going out. Um, I really didn't have to do much to process this, uh, just work with the tones. There were a lot of footprints that did take some time. Um, I just don't want to see any influence of the hand of man. I like things to be the way they would be in nature. Distant Island, this photo has uh, been in more juried exhibitions than any other. I think I'm up to 12 now. Um, I take my workshop participants, <coughs> excuse me, to this location every year. Ironically, not one person has found the section of rock where I've shot this, and it's not a large area. It's a very small section, and it required that I, I shoot uh, very close. It was a close-up. So here I had to combine, um, you know, a close-up with, with a distant shot. I think you were asking about that, Terry, at one point um, in a landscape. This is not yet titled. Uh, I just came upon it as I was putting together this presentation. Um, it's a hidden section of the coast in central Oregon, and unlike many coastal areas in Oregon, it's not well known. It's not marked well with signage and it requires a bit of hike to get to it. But I, I think I photographed here three nights and just did a, a, a big series of, I mean, a numerous um, series of images. A lot of you know this place. Uh, it's also a favorite I've shot here many times, but never with fog. And fog was pouring in the night that I was there. Um, but it never really came in quite far enough to be within the tunnel of trees. Um, as I said, it's it's um, tough to always achieve what you hope for when you can only visit an area periodically. Factory Butte, perfectly centered image again. It's all about shape and texture and tones. I've been to this area several times, love the remoteness, but the area surrounding this butte is being destroyed by um, off-road vehicles. As I approached um, the butte last year, there was a haze in the area, uh, and I was far away. Um, it, it was miles I'd see this haze, so I just figured it was a brush fire. But as I um, came up closer, uh, the off-road vehicles were going all over the place, and um, uh, cutting through the, the the crust of the earth, which takes, from what I've read, about 100 years to heal. But the BLM, BLM uh, it's BLM land, and they have opened up more area to recreational vehicles. Was invited to be on the Southern Board of, uh, the Board of, what is it, Southern Alliance of something Utah. 
but uh, I, I'm really not I, I need person is, I have the patience to sit in meetings, so I don't know. I, I get that instead. Balance rack. I think uh, Judy had a question for your for your last image. Sure. Judy, you're muted. What is the size, the overall size Good. of the photo? Good. Good. Huge. I mean, enormous, uh, gigantic. You can see it for miles. Um, maybe a half a mile long, a mile long. I don't know. It is very, you can see the sand dunes in the foreground, even down by the very edge of the, the print. Those are large sand dunes. Um, this was photographed several years ago. I was back there two years ago and I decided I wanted to try and get closer. And it, it was maybe a 15 minute walk just to get to the beginning of all this. And then I, I followed, um, I don't know what you would call it, a groove where rain had flowed down and formed uh, like a, um, I don't know, formed something. It was only wide enough for one foot. So I had to put a foot in this groove and then the next foot and the next foot. So I did that for like 45 minutes and I thought, I can't keep going like this. So I decided to hike up and it was a steep hike to get up to a ridge. And when I got up there, I was literally scared shitless because it was 75 feet, probably um, extremely steep. And there was only a ridge at the top, maybe a foot to up to two feet wide. I couldn't go down. It was too steep. There was no way. So my only way of getting out was just to continue forward. And I was on my hands and knees. And uh, I'm not afraid of heights, but I, I couldn't look down. Um, but I did get myself out of there or I wouldn't be doing this presentation. Um, but it, it is enormous. Uh, it's near Canes, Caneville, uh, Utah, which is not far from Capitol Reef National Park. So if, if you know where that is, it kind of gives you an idea. You'll see um, later on a picture of what it truly looks like around there. So um, Balance Rock, we talked about that. Um, uh, this is Slick Rock. Uh, I'm not sure why it's called Slick Rock because it's very, very coarse. But I had to lay my tripod out almost flat. Um, and fine tune the composition to get the alignment to be exactly where I wanted it to be. Um, to get a sense of scale on this one, that uh, crescent shaped rock is about four times my height, which is now about four or five less inches left. It was before it was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, multiple myeloma is a blood cancer that robs your bones of calcium before it's brought into remission. So I, I was about five inches taller. Uh, I lost those five inches over a two to three month period and uh, wasn't able to walk unassisted for several months. But uh, it, it's under control now. It will come back. This kind of cancer always comes back, uh, at which time they'll hit it with more um, chemo. But I take uh, immunomodulatory drug now to help, uh, which is like $14,000 every three weeks. It's crazy that the pharmaceutical companies charge so much um this is an area near the wave maybe you've heard of the wave rather than shoot the classic shots that i've seen a million times i ventured off in other directions all of the central lines the tones the lighting on on, on. i was lucky that i got this kind of lighting um this is in yosemite just burn bark uh to detail this was a fun shot, um, suds on our window. I was using, cleaning the windows and it's like, wow, this is, this is fun. Um, it's required a few hours to make an intricate mask so they could drop in uh, the sky of my choosing. In a prior uh, artist talk, someone told me that I could have used automated tools in Photoshop to create my mask, but there were dark trees behind these dark legs in the tower. That wasn't possible. Um, plus those automated masks aren't as accurate so getting around all those little wires, um, it took hours. Um, again, very much softening of clouds here. Um, I've completely done away with the horizon. This is not what it looked like when it was shot. Uh, it was, you know, typical day. Um, this was by Bandon, Utah. Um, 
there's a little gall sitting in the tub. I call it lone gall. And I, I planned on getting rid of that gall when I got home. It's like, what was it thinking? This boat, it's what it's all about. It's about that lone gall. Um, I called it yeah. almost here with these question. Yeah. Hi, Jan. You said you, you know, make, look for suggestions. I had an idea. You talked a lot about how what the picture doesn't look like when you started. You may, I, I would like to see occasionally a picture with the original raw where you started with and the final image. You, you, you will. Oh, okay. Will. Thank you. Hmm. Or did you? Hmm. I've lost track here. If not, we'll, we'll go back quickly. Okay. Um, Music Hall, it, it's in LA. It's the um, it's a Geary building. I wanted the clouds to, to 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 feel like music was wafting, you know, out of the building. So I, I did this effect on the clouds here. Um, Spire ring down. I uh, shot in a lighthouse at Picture Rocks National Lakeshore in Michigan. The lighthouse ranger allowed me to do some shooting late in the afternoon after it was closed to visitors. Uh, that way I didn't have to have sand falling on my face as they were going up the, the stairs. I love the motion uh, created by not only the stairs, but the railing, uh, the shadows had a nice touch. And as I said, I'm pretty sure Alfred Hitchcock would, would approve with this, this shadows there. Uh, Agave Victoria. Again, it's all about symmetry, texture, contrast, and of course, my love of succulents. And this is one of two succulents that you saw um the the agaves in 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 the slideshow it's not the one that won the ansel adams award but um i like this 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 one more it came a few years after the other one. Oh, here we go the interpretations so we're going to compare an original what can't look like in the camera to um to the final image so this was uh shot at cape perpetua um central oregon it's an area called it's a it's called Thor's Well. Water gushes in, flows up over the rock. Well, depending on what what the tide's like, and then goes down in. So um, that's not a sky that you'd see in a Jambo photo. I don't like patchiness like that. Um, I don't care for strong horizons like that. There's nothing going on in the foreground here. So here's the final image. Um, Obviously spliced together. Um, I had shot so many images, and the foreground here is from another image. Um, the clouds are from something else. But going back, you can see the before and the after. So a little bit of shifting in perspective also, but before, after. David, I'm going to show you what you were uh, thinking. And here's, oh, yes, thank you. this is called uh, Ties the Bind. The biggest collector of my uh, lives here in my hometown. And she had seen this structure um, near Columbus, Ohio. And I've had to play it a lot as I was going to the James Cancer Hospital. Uh, sometimes we were going twice a week for a few months. But um, there was a lot of fog that morning. I, that's the reason I went. I wanted to shoot this with fog. As I neared this structure, um, the fog dissipated. So um, I, through the use of Photoshop, I um, put some fog back in. There was also a building, an ugly um, concrete building sitting next to that structure. <clears throat> and to me, totally distracting. So with uh, some Photoshop work, that disappeared. Uh, ironically, as I was down there shooting, a, a train was approaching. It's like, now what the hell am I going to do? Um, so I hid in that that little concrete building. And as I stood in there, the train stopped. And it's like, well, there was a quarry uh, on the other side of the trees, so I couldn't go that way. So my only option was just walk down the tracks and pass the, um, what's it called, the, the engine or whatever. And uh, I just kind of waved at the guys, and they seemed fine. Um, typical shot from Lake Superior. I, so much of my work comes from this area. This is near um, the area where I do the workshop. And water generally appears like this. Um, again, there's a strong line on the horizon. There's nothing happening in the clouds. So I took this to this. So before, 
and after, uh, creating much more just of, of, of a mood. Um, this is a straightforward photo. To me, this is quite, there's just so much more mood uh, happening here. So uh, I also thought I'd show you um, that, you know, like I said, I have over 300 photos that are not resolved. Um, things we want to work, but won't. So I shot this um, this um, photo near Santa Fe. I forget the name of the town, it doesn't matter. And there was just so much shit around here. There was, you know, clutter. And there was this ugly billboard, this bulletin board out front. So I thought, well, I know I'm going to want to put this somewhere else. So I ended up shooting assets. Um, that bulletin board was um, in the way. So I shot different angles so that I could then, you know, get rid of that billboard. So I had to find <coughs> a field with the same kind of lighting, uh, same time of day. So I decided this would be the field and then combine the two to make this. And it it just doesn't do it for me. I mean, um, it was an attempt, but I, 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 I highly doubt it will ever make it into my portfolio. But I just thought, I mean, if you go in tight on this, you can go in as tight as you want. You cannot tell that I have placed that building um, in that location. So um, things like that are critically important to me. If I'm going to do something, I want everything to be right. I want the lighting to be coming from the same angle. I don't want anyone to be able to see where I've combined anything. So like I said, you can look as close as you want, but you just won't see it. So uh, marketing, uh, honestly, it's my least favorite part of the whole process. It takes an enormous amount of time, but without it, the public would not have an opportunity to see my work. I may be old school for putting a lot of energy into a website, but it serves as a place for potential customers to look at my work, to see my CV, and to learn about my business. I realize that much of the population lives on social media, Facebook and Instagram, for instance. But does anyone spend more than a couple seconds looking at a photo on Instagram? I did some research yesterday, and in 2023, 54,000 photos are taken every second. 196 million every hour, 4.7 billion per day, and over 100 million are shared on Instagram every day. So the odds of seeing my work seem pretty slim to me. And as far as I know, no one has ever contacted me about purchasing a print after seeing it uh, on social media. So the book, the book Don was talking about, it's called Quiet Contemplation. It is... Um, um, several things rose to the top of my to-do list when I was diagnosed with cancer in 2017. Producing a hardcover book was at the top of the list. I wanted it to become uh, my my legacy. Um, I don't like want a tombstone or any of that stupid shit. So the book is my legacy. Um, and leading a photo workshop was my second goal. Uh, I, I just felt I'd never be able to achieve that second goal because I couldn't walk uh, unassisted for so long but I've achieved both goals. The book um, titled Quite a Con Contemplation um, became a reality after three years of hard work. Several well-known photographers offered to write copy for the book. Some of you may know Art Wolf, Alan Ross, Charlie Kramer, and others. And as I said, John Sexton helped me with some technical issues. It's 144 pages printed on an 80 pound cover weight paper throughout. 111 duotone photos printed with a stochastic printing process rather than half tones. Um, and that's what John Sexton uh, introduced me to. Uh, every photo has uh, spot varnish. So if you're interested in ordering copy, information is available on my website, or you can ask me about it at the end of the talk. The work, oh, there's inside of the book, uh, just a spread. The workshop. It's an incredible location. Um, this is where um, the uh, photo was taken that I showed you earlier. Um, the rock is is unlike I've seen anywhere. You have a combination of volcanic rock that was flowing over other types of volcanic rock. Uh, wave action coming in. Um, sometimes this entire area would be covered with waves. Um, this is an area that used one photo that you saw. 
at both areas, uh, this is the same location, and I take my uh, workshop participants here. Uh, another area is called the Sand River, and the water can get really raging in there. Uh, I was flipping in there with a friend a few years ago and took this photo of him. Um, pictographs are, are are pretty awesome. Uh, you can see the, um, the, the whatever the animal is there on the right. These are two of my workshop participants. Oh, wrong way. Um, this is my nephew who helped with the workshop the first year. Um, so he, this really wasn't from the workshop, but he was there. He was my assistant. Um, and this is him standing on the deck of uh, Rock Island Lodge where the workshop uh, takes place. This is the building. And here um, is a compilation of some of the work that's come from the workshop. Not everyone works in black and white. Ironically, the photo in the middle and the photo on the lower right were done by the same person. Um, I'm passionate about the wilderness. Um, I see so much human destruction and, and it can't be replaced once it's gone. Uh, National parks, monuments, beyond land, they have inconsistent, inconsistent rules and regulations, guidelines. Um, there's, with the more people, um, Visiting them, there's a, a proliferation. I can't even say the word proliferation of parking lots, signs, railings, noise, and that distracts from the very thing we seek to experience. Uh, I remember being um, at the very most outer point of Canyonlands, and a car pulled up, and a group of people got out and started taking photos, and they were extremely loud. And I said, you know, I just asked them if they could just be quiet. I said, this is a beautiful place. They got back in their car and they left. It's like, what was the point? So anyhow, moving forward, um, I I just, I, I saw this and I just stopped. It's like, you know, what the heck's going on here? Uh, no camping, no overnight parking. It's just an area that had been destroyed um, in Oregon. Same thing here. This is this is to give you an idea of size. Uh, this is straight on view, not the side view of uh, Factory Butte. But people are just going off road and breaking through that crust. And once that happened, that crust has taken um, a millennium to to form. And even a footstep breaks it. And once it's broken, the the dust. Uh oh, Jan, can anybody hear me? Just flies. There Same area. Uh, is uh, on wide in the road. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? I think you froze and we were trying to, um, you froze for just 30 seconds, I think. Okay. So, parting shots. These are just fun. Uh, just a few shots. Uh, me and Smokey, it's like I couldn't resist. It's like, wow. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of the roads I've been on, um, this is near Ca um, um, Canyonlands, Capitol Reef. Um, going to um, 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 the Wave and um, Wire Pass Canyon. This was the most crazy road I've ever, ever been on. The hairpin turns literally were so tight. You don't see them here, but they were so tight, <laughs> you couldn't begin to see if anyone was coming the other direction. So, this isn't Capitol Reef. I've been, on, I've been on that road. Were you going down or coming up? I went both directions. Uh, I can't imagine. And when you're down. at the top and you look down, it's amazing sight. I've got a photo of it. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I don't know if I could do it going down. If your brakes fail, uh, you're doomed. Yeah. I mean, it. I got up to it. And I thought, can I do this? But um, yeah. I love the road though, going from Moab to here, and right. uh, shit like this happens. Um, I was that was on this road and, and this location where I had this flat tire, um, um, an area. I think you saw this photograph. Um, this was an area on uh, Shore Acres in Oregon, and you don't get any perspective here, but this was about a seventy-five. It, the ledge was about seventy-five feet up. And um, I just kind of inched and wiggled along to get out here, but uh, I haven't started working on those photos yet. 
crazy. Y'all, some of you know this, uh, Mount Tam, um, that photographs on my website. Um, this photo never made it, but it was an interesting place. Um, just uh, off the road, it's not marked. It's it's nothing. It's not a park or anything. It's just an area. And uh, this was, I think, it, Drake's Beach, Point Reyes. Um, I was fortunate to see these two bulls going at it. This is an iPhone photo, but I just threw it in because, you know, it's out there by you. Salt Point, crazy place. I love shooting there. And um, this was a hike to Shishi Beach, Shishai Beach at Olympic. And there's that shot again from Oregon. And I love to eat. So, you know, I spend the time um, making some good. This was the shrimp pasta thing. And oh my God, this is not far from Point Ray Station down the road, but forget the little town. The best lemon ginger scones on the planet. And I'm not sure what he was saying, but uh, I was in a remote area and it was around Halloween time and I just had to take this photo. I think he was telling me to get the hell off the, the land there, but anyhow. And, well, oh, wrong way. And the parting shot um, there in Oregon. So that's it. I can't hear anyone. I, I had, can you hear me? Thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah. Hope, hope you have lots of questions. Great. Loved your uh, demonstration. I had two questions. Sure. One is all your black and white landscape photos. Do you take them um, originally in color and convert them? I do. Um, and, I like to be able to control the the each tone. I mean, each color. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you use Lightroom at all or just Photoshop? No. Um, I'm one of the few people uh, that doesn't use Lightroom. I, I feel, uh, like I said, I started using Photoshop so many years ago and to me it's it's my friend so i just don't feel a need for lightroom other than it would be nice to use it for cataloging uh but i'm so much now into the art that i just i don't have the patience to learn the techniques of using lightroom even for cataloging so um i use bridge to look okay. at you're not alone jared i i don't use lightroom either just bridge and raw and photoshop yeah <laughs> yeah i had one more question sure all your you know parking in all these locations out of the way have you ever had any problems with theft no let me think <clears throat> possibly <laughs> and i'll get to that but i did talk to someone who had parked near oh what's the name of the town um near shiprock Farmington, uh, Farmington, New Mexico, and was shooting um, and left his truck. And as he was shooting, he noticed um, a vehicle approaching his vehicle and they vandalized uh, his truck. I mean, there's nothing he could do. My little camper is, is my home away from home and I park it and it stays in a location while I go out and do day shoots. Uh, it's vulnerable. <clears throat> There's a woman who promotes uh, these small campers made by a company called New Camp, and hers was stolen. I have like a $250 lock that goes on the hitch, and I have one of these locks like this that goes around the tire. But the most important thing, I have, I had labels printed that say the unit is protected by GPS tracking. You know, if you steal it, um, you will be found, you, you'll be tracked or whatever. So from what I've read, that's one of the best deterrents. Um, I I seem to have lost some money um, on a trip. That was the spring of 2022. And I spent hours <laughs> looking for the money. Um, it was in a Ziploc bag inside the, the, the camper. And it either went in the trash, which could have happened, or... Someone could have taken it when they were uh, looking around the, the camper. They they were it was a couple. Uh, I talked with them quite a while, and uh, they wanted to see the camper. So I mean, they could have picked it up. I don't know, but um, I was going forward or backward. Um, I did shows in Chicago for a number of years, and there was a couple who bought a thousand dollar print, and they wanted a letter of authenticity. So they obviously knew something about 
the value of photography or they wouldn't have asked for a letter of authenticity. <clears throat> so I said, well, I don't take them off the wall. I ship them to you. They said, well, we're from uh, Argentina and we want to take it with us. They were on a little scooter and they said they were there on business. So I said, sure. I um, swiped their credit card. It ran fine. They signed an invoice and they were off of the print. And a few days later, I got a call from Square and they said, you know, it's being disputed. Uh, it was supposed to be $100, not $1,000. And I said, well, I don't even have $100 in my in my listing of items. And they said, well, <coughs> it may take up to uh, two months to resolve. And it did take a while. And I won. But Square told me they have the right to dispute a second time in their home country, which they did. They said that's very rare that anyone will dispute something twice, but they did and they won. So they got my print for, for $100. Oh, no. So, yeah, it, shit like that happens. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm a fortunate person to uh, be where I'm at and have had enough sales. Um, and and I couldn't believe how many people supported my book project. I was, I hope to. Um, I did a fundraising campaign that was a lot of work. It was comprised of a, a book. I had a, a digital copy printed of the book, a small version that was 24 pages. And there was a letter uh, that explained the project, levels of giving, um, my CV. But anyhow, that was sent to 170 people. And I hoped to um, generate 24, I mean, $12,000 so that I could print the book, not at Hemlock Printing, but print the book more locally. Instead of twelve thousand, I raised over twenty uh, thirty six thousand uh, dollars, more than three times what I hoped to generate. So because of that, I was able to use Hemlock Printing. Um, I've set up a grant that funds one photographer per year to do one project at Lake Superior Provincial Park. Um, so money is generated from the sale of the book at this point go to helping pay for that grant and fund future projects that <laughs> I want to do. So even despite any of the negatives, um, it's all been an incredible journey. Uh, I'm a lucky man. Uh, although there are some very low periods. Like I said, there's so many of us doing what we do. And I often sit back and say, why do I, why am I doing it? Um, I don't know. So uh, moods just kind of come and go. Well, I'm glad you're doing it, Jan, and you stay healthy. Yeah, I try. Yeah, yeah more work, lots more work to do. Yeah, I'm planning a trip for for the fall. Well, well first, I leave in a week for um, Lake Superior, the Minnesota Shores. Someone that took my workshop um, two years ago hired me for a week to guide him up there. Um, so we're going to do that. Then I'm heading over into southern south dakota um, an area that i haven't really explored much so then i come home and i'm going to isle royal this summer um, national park and then in the fall i do the workshop up in canada and then i want to take off for two or three weeks either coastal california oregon again or the southwest so it's it's becoming difficult because as i age and with you know cancer always there um uh, none of us you know we're we're all getting older except for you stephanie you're not getting older <laughs> but anyhow um we senior citizen people you know we do i think we do look at life a little differently um you have to do as much as you can do in whatever time you know you you have so every day is important so aren't there any more questions <clears throat> i love questions make something of it if you don't have one so is everyone falling asleep do you have uh, for your landscape favorite focal lengths or you use a variety hmm. of lenses hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm I would say it just it totally depends on what I'm shooting um, the distant island the focal length was shorter. I, I don't really like extreme short. Um, it's it's a pain, but I mean, uh, 
when you're only a few inches from something at F11, your depth of field isn't that great. So uh, that's always, you know, in the back of my head. How do I achieve achieve what I'm setting out to do and have it be in focus? That was something, you know, that was critical to the F64 group of photographers, you know, way back when, that critical focus. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. What's, what's your favorite part of this, of making a picture? <clears throat> I think the favorite part is 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 just being in nature aside from photography just being there. The second part that I like most is actually taking the photos. I get a real charge when I it's it's so nice that we live in a time when we can see the image that we've just shot unless you're shooting film and um yeah. and some people still do that. Um the 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 Photoshop work, um, I'm either really into it or I'm not. I can sit and start working and sometimes, you know, work till one in the morning. Other times, I just don't feel like getting into that. Printing is a pain in the butt. Framing is tedious. I do all my own framing. Um, I have uh, a woman who cuts my frames using, you know, uh, a wizard autom automated cutter. So, no. Uh, that's the only part of the whole process that I, that I have someone else do, just cut the windows. So um, if you're interested in the book or the workshop, um, please let me know. Why don't you post that information in the chat? Do you know how to do that? No, but okay. Um, maybe Donald can do that for you. I'll, I'll do that. Um, yeah. his, his website is very easy to remember. It's bellimages.com name images.com i'll put it yep. in the chat then so yeah i i love the um cracker image thank you you know <clears throat> somewhere w back in here www.bellimages.com i'm sorry <laughs> sorry that's okay i, I would love that too I'd like to do a lot more of that work. It's fun. Uh, you know, it'd be fun to do just maybe a little blur book, uh, at, which means a cheaper book um, of those kind of images. But um, yeah, I had so many of those. I started looking through them and um, the friend who was in the stairwell still does that kind of work. She lives in Chicago and uh, it's been a while since we went out and photographed, but uh yeah, she she loves that. Did you I, have show a, I have a question about managing tones. Yeah. When you take a photograph, if I don't use Photoshop, I just use my iPhone and I'm a beginner. But okay. I'm wondering how I can manage the tones without using Photoshop. Well, the perfect person to answer your question, I think, is Donald Kenny. Um, he's doing some of that now, oh. and he might be able to help you. I mean, are you using an iPhone, an yes. actual iPhone? Well, there are editing tools in iPhone. If you hit edit, yes. and you can just, you can just, I hate to say play with them, but play with them. And if you <clears throat> want to go back to the way the photo was, you know, originally you can just hit revert. So yeah, okay. Uh, there are <clears throat> there are lots of little applications, lots of them that you could use um that would work in conjunction with your, your iPhone photos. Okay. I haven't used them, but uh, there are people oh, they're good. Judy, Judy, I'd recommend uh Carbon. Um it's an iPhone uh app. Mm -hmm. Carbon, um black and white studio. How do you um, how do you spell it? I'll send you. I'll send it to you by email. Okay. Did you put it in the chat? Because I'd love to see it. Yeah, sure. Hey, Mallory, you had a question. You need to unmute. Thank you. Did you show? Did you already show um, the before and after of the cracker one? Uh, Actually, there was no before and after. That was shot on slide film back uh -huh. in the 70s uh processed at the photo lab where i worked so 
there's no before and after it it just is i don't even know if i used photoshop on that so that, that's a, i think that was a straight shot was that film or uh, yes slide film yeah 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 that, that kind of work is fun um you know i have over thirty-five thousand photos on my iphone um and they're not really in categories i just search by place so if i want to see what i shot near um um capitol reef i just you know look at the map and go into that area and it shows all the photos that i've that shot there because it geotags them hey, but that but that one was you said that was a that was a film shot yeah that was back in the 70s yeah it was great yeah. i bought a slide scanner um you know I, I pulled out all the old slides and i thought you know i'd like to to work on some of them some of the, that bothers me and a lot of people, all these photos are being taken and stored in a cloud, uh, various clouds, like Apple has their own cloud. Um, as people die, there's no record of them. They're, they're, they're just, they vanish, you know, they're just, they're zeros and ones, you know, digital information. Most of us have, you know, photos from our, parents or grandparents or you know things like that so is none of that going to be important to people in the future i don't know and the the use of artificial intelligence um i have a friend on facebook who has been doing some incredible work and he said how long does this take and he said two to three minutes so um where does where does that fit into the gallery scene? I, I, it's it's a real thing, and um, there's no reason it it shouldn't go to galleries. It just needs to be, um, it needs to be transparent and let people know that you know this is not a photograph. It's been created with artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Well, the, I think there's also a problem for me unless they change that with. With black and white film, you can you can it lasts forever, not in that color. But but when you print something digitally, it doesn't last forever, especially if you keep it in the sun. Well, yeah, sun's and, bad. And it's it's so, better if you, if you're if you're printing it with pigment inks rather than dyes. Um, it's actually pigment that's being put on the paper. So, Wilhelm research says. Um, up oh, 200 years for black and white. I forget what it is for color, but um, yeah. That, yeah, Same. digital, but it's, it's still, so you can't really hand it down. And that's the problem I've had with it. You know, just, I have pictures from, you know, the 30s and 40s that I've inherited that are still, you can, you can print them and they're still going to be there and they're going to be there just the way they were. And, and people pay thousands of dollars for digital prints and they're not going to last that long. It's, it seems ridiculous to me. Print in black and white. <clears throat> so this is Joanne. I Did you say what camera you use and what format, you know, how large your images are? Oh, I think Jan is frozen. Oh, I started with Canada. Oh, what name? There we're coming back. You all were frozen. Can you hear me now? Yes. No, you, you were now? frozen. <laughs> okay. We were yes. all frozen. Um, I started with Canon equipment way back um, in college, and I've just stayed with them. Um, it's it's served me well. I would like to be using um, medium format gear, but. My uh, neurosurgeon at um, the James Cancer Hospital told me after surgery that I shouldn't be carrying more than five pounds for the rest of my life. I looked at him and smiled and I said, um, my camera and lens and tripod are worth five pounds. And he just smiled back. He, I mean, he understood. And I do carry more than five pounds. But um, I can't carry. <clears throat> I shot in, um, is it Abiquiu? Uh, near where... Um, Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm having a mental block. Um, what was her name? The painter, Mary oh. Ed Steichen. Yes. Um, um, what's her? 
Derek, no. Oh, damn. O'Keefe. Yes. For you, O'Keefe. Yes, I was shooting in an area down there, and um, I had my tripod, the camera body, and one lens. And I had hiked about four miles, and the last five minutes, the pain level was getting up near a nine out of ten. So that was a bad time. I really need a, like a um, a Sherpa or a donkey or something to uh, carry a my do gear. A dolly. Absolutely. Yeah, I bought a dolly. Uh, that works well as long as you're not in crazy, you know, terrain that's going all over the place. I took that dolly up to Chimney Rock at Point Reyes. Um, and it worked well most of the way, except when there was a, a, a gully where rain had washed, you know. Oh, yeah. It's like... Uh, uh, a, a cart didn't work too well there so yeah but we do what we do <clears throat> so uh, i hope i've inspired you all a bit giving you some ideas um, whatever and if you have comments or questions uh, please let me know hopefully it wasn't too long no it's perfect okay that was great Oh, it's great. Yeah, great.